Good evening. And okay. welcome. Okay. Um, there, is that working? Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right uh, welcome to our talk on open container technologies and OpenStack. And, um, oh. That'll, that'll do it. <laughs> we have right. the technology. Wonderful. I didn't want to go to the bathroom with this and have that be on. Okay, welcome to our talk on uh, open container technology and OpenStack. Um, so we're going to cover um, Kubernetes, uh, the open container initiative, and CNCF, and how those um, integrate, those technologies integrate with OpenStack, as well as um, the larger container community. So before we get started, how many people here have heard of the OCI? Okay, about a third. And uh, the CNCF? Smaller okay. number. About a quarter. And anybody using Kubernetes right now? In okay. production. Sweet. That guy. Welcome. Well done. Okay. So I'm Daniel Crook. I work for IBM as a senior software engineer. I uh, partner hands-on with customers to do POCs based on open source technology, uh, Docker and containers, of course, and OpenStack, but also Cloud Foundry and um, a new serverless framework that we have called OpenWhisk. My colleague, Jeff. I'm Jeff Borek, and I work in uh, open source. I've been doing that for about a decade now, and uh, for IBM, I've been uh, working in Linux originally, and then most recently in cloud before my current role in open technologies and partnerships. And I'm Sarah Novotny. I work for Google, and my focus has been open source communities for the last 10 or 15 years. I run the open source community side of Kubernetes. Great. And off we go. We'll leave Daniel to his bed. All right, stagecraft. <laughs> okay, so um, today uh, I'm going to give you, uh, start off with a level set just on container technology, uh, why it's so attractive, and um, some of the, the companies and organizations that have been part of it in the past and, and hopefully into the future as well. Uh, we'll look at how that container technology integrates at several la layers of OpenStack, and uh, in particular how it, uh, how it supports Kubernetes. And then we'll look into the Open Container Initiative itself, as well as the CNCF, um, to see how those are defining standards going forward for container technology. And um, then tie everything together at the end, um, and, uh, and we'll learn more about the, the Kubernetes uh, Special Interest Group within the OpenStack community. OK, um, so container technology today, um, in 2016, um, it's become very attractive um, for many different reasons. A lot of folks are now able to use it in production, uh, take advantage of the benefits that it has. Uh, so containers, uh, they're able to provide process isolation on, um, on a host um, and also limit access to other resources. Um, the networking, the storage, the compute resources. Um, they are logically similar to virtual machines, um, but they are much more efficient because they share the host kernel of the underlying operating system. And they avoid any of the um, translation needed uh, by a virtual machine that might be running on top of um, a hypervisor. Um, so basically, on the left, uh, you've essentially cut out the middleman of, of all the extra software on top of a host. Um, the other key benefit, um, since that makes systems um, generally more efficient, is that you're able to now package applications, package services, uh, into um, a self-contained image that can, um, that can capture all the dependencies and really strip out what you need to have installed on the underlying host system that's running your containers. Uh, so it provides a, a very clean separation, which is great for developers who are building uh, the services, or OpenStack developers creating um, any of the services themselves, packaging those into something and deploying it not only on their own workstation, but out to any deployment environments that they, they have. So of course, there's, you know, this, this makes it super efficient to run them, makes them very portable. Um, there are some trade-offs that it, uh, I won't get too deep into, um, but one uh, way I've, I've used to describe it is if you have you know, a need for housing as a person, you can choose to buy a house, get the whole property, uh, get your own electrical system, get your own plumbing, uh, or you can rent an apartment, uh, which may be more efficient, maybe cheaper 
for a short-lived stay that you have in a city uh, versus a longer, you know, uh, buying a house. Um, so you can rent an apartment, but you might have that shared resources of if the plumbing or electrical system goes down in that whole apartment complex, uh, you've got the shared problem there. So uh, that's basically the, the analogy of the trade-off there. Um, so that's where we are today with containers. Um, over the last um, 17, even longer years, container technology itself has been evolving. Lots of great ideas, lots of trends have been coming together uh, with that technology. Um, so going back to 1978, 1979 with uh, CH root, uh, isolating uh, where the file system starts, uh, what access you might have there. FreeBSD, 17 years ago, extended that to other resources um, on free, FreeBSD Unix. And Linux took those ideas, uh, tried to port them over um, shortly after. Um, unfortunately, that required quite a bit of um, extra work to take advantage of that feature. Um, you had to recompile the kernel, and a lot of folks who were using distributions didn't really have the, the, um, the ability or the desire to do that. Um, separately, outside of um, Linux again, Solaris started to bring the idea of not only having the isolated resources on the compute node, but also a way to package those in snapshots. Unfortunately, it also required a Solaris-specific system, um, the ZFS, the, the Z file system. Um, so a couple of years go by, and Google um, takes a different approach that doesn't require recompiling the kernel, using features that are already in the operating system, which really started to make containers uh, more usable. And Red Hat then built on that innovation, adding um, support for user namespaces, allowing you to have root privileges within containers, but not, at, not outside of the system. So adding some nice security isolation. And uh, IBM, uh, we then provided some tooling that made it a little easier to use those features that are now in the system, um, and basically provided some tools around C groups, um, the process containers, and the namespacing. But really what made containers hot uh, three years ago, a startup called Docker built some developer-friendly tooling to take advantage of how you run those containers and also how you package them efficiently to really take what was already there in the system and just bring it to a larger audience. Um, so there's been a lot of innovation in the past with containers, um, and again, it's the future with the OCI and CNCF uh, that we'll cover a little later. Um, hopefully it's a continuum with a lot of innovation being added to the platform. Okay, so containers um, and OpenStack, they're not just in one area or another. Um, because of all those benefits, um, you know, the ability to build and use fewer resources, deploy things faster, test things faster. They made their way into a lot of different projects. Um, so one of the first uh, places, if you, if you take that analogy of a virtual machine and a container, uh, they showed up in Nova, uh, just another compute asset that could be plugged into, um, plugged into Nova that could be treated as basically an, an image, an instance on a compute node. Um, Heat then uh, provided a way to support those, those type of compute resources. So you can deploy groups of containers. Um, and more recently, Magnum has uh, provided an abstraction layer to run container orchestration systems on top of OpenStack. Um, for OpenStack itself, it's also a uh, distributed application that has a lot of services. So uh, the Cola project has now been able to uh, containerize the undercloud. So Magnum lets you run containers on OpenStack. Cola lets you deploy OpenStack itself. Uh, Murano provides a package catalog and, um, of containerized applications to run on clouds. And Courier takes the Neutron networking model and maps that uh, to containers. So you have kind of a common interface between your virtual machines, your bare metal nodes, and your containers. Okay, so I'll hand it off to Jeff to talk about the Open Container Initiative. So uh, we saw earlier that quite a few people at least had some familiarity with the uh, OCI. And it was uh, announced by uh, Solomon Hakes at the uh, DockerCon event uh, middle of last year, 2015. Um, I'll go back a little into the history behind it. But the most important thing about the OCI from my perspective uh, is that it's really all about governance. 
at the end of the day. Because open source is great, and I think safely say that everyone here to varying degrees is a large open source fan. But the license is only one element of an open source project. And at IBM, we like to talk about code, community, and culture. And the innovation that the um, Docker crew introduced is very significant in that it makes the container technology much more easy to consume. And that's about the time I got involved with actually Docker. It was a, early in 2014, I was at an OpenStack summit. In fact, it was the one down in uh, Atlanta. And there was a huge buzz on the expo floor about this new company that had just sort of had a near-death experience and had done a bit of a pivot. And they were now calling themselves Docker, and they had an open source project that was also called Docker. And how was this going to have an impact? And well, it was going to make containers much more uh, accessible or easier to use by your typical uh, application developer or system uh, administrator. But an open source license, again, just puts the code out there. The real question is, you know, how does a fundamental technology like that uh, get shared by a community so that it's really a level playing field and many different companies and organizations have free access to it. And as you see up on the slide here, one of the key points is it's not tightly associated with any one single company. It's also important that uh, this type of project or this type of technology have an open governance structure and is associated with an organization uh, that can help bring it forward in a long-term, you know, stable and meaningful way. So you can see by this next slide, when this was announced, there was about half, a little less than, maybe a little bit more than half of the current companies that are involved. So this has continued to be a very important element of the ecosystem as the OCI has evolved over the last uh, little over a year now. And we talked a bit about Docker earlier in this session, but going into it even a little bit further, I was involved with Docker in, officially in 2015 because I was proud to be part of the uh, open source steering committee. In fact, I was asked to help chair that for a period of time. But as we moved forward, it became really you know, in apparent, especially when there was some conflict in the community because of this issue of, well, how do we separate you know, Docker the project from Docker the commercial entity? And how do we you know, achieve clarity around that? And who gets to decide you know, what's actually in the spec and the code associated with it. And other interesting questions too, in terms of like, should this be based on you know, the code or should, you know, should the spec lead? You know, what's the right approach to take here? So how many are familiar with CoreOS? I know they're here at the expo hall. So through conflict, they actually helped act as a bit of a catalyst because it, it furthered this dialogue within the community about, you know, what's the right thing to do here? You know, what's, what's a fair way to help move this technology forward and still give uh, the creative people at Docker their due with respect to the uh, new thinking that they brought to the model? So, I was really personally, you know, totally excited when Solomon announced uh, the contribution that they were willing to make to start the OCI. And you can see by this next slide that it, it's evolved even since that announcement was made about, again, a little over a year ago. In addition to the Docker engine, uh, the secondary format, the format specification has also been introduced to help bring portability to the OCI concept. But it's also important that the OCI 
doesn't expand too broadly, right? I mean, the whole idea is to try and, using the shipping metaphor, establish the boundaries of what a container is, how to make it portable, how to make it interoperable, but not have scope creep go to the point where this starts to get into uh, higher level thinking around automation and orchestration. Because one of the other key elements of trying to get this right, and it's a very delicate balancing act, is that you know standardization is great because it allows everyone to participate in a meaningful way and it can help make markets. But if you extend it too far and you lock things down too much, it can actually get to a point where you might stifle innovation or prevent some other new innovation from coming into the marketplace in a meaningful way. Just a quick look at you know, who's participating, because there's been a lot of things in the news, if you've followed this closely, and hopefully most of you haven't, because there are lots of interesting things going on, but there's been some friction even after this announcement was made, which was intended to eliminate some of the friction, again, over a year ago. But to uh, Docker and CoreOS and Red Hat and other people participating, uh, to their credit, this uh, effort has moved forward consistently over the last uh, 18 months. And you'll see both uh, the 1.0 version of the um, specifications for the engine and the uh, format come out uh, later, probably, I'm going to say, before the end of November. I thought we might have been done by now, but we're still working through some of the details on it. But you can see on this slide that uh, Red Hat, Docker, uh, and a whole host of companies from a wide variety of perspectives has been contributing into this initiative. And you're going to see other things happen, I think, over the course of the last quarter of this year and even into the first half of next year around this space to try and help you know, keep this technology moving forward. The last thing I want to say about the OCI is just a reminder about this attempt to keep it focused and uh, not have the scope expand too far because there's a complementary organization that was announced about the same time frame. And it's all about this concept of cloud native. And to transition into that thinking, uh, I want to just mention that when it comes to you know, cloud native computing, it's really trying to take advantage of this whole paradigm of, well, application development has been done in this traditional way, and we've all heard of DevOps, but when you can truly move to a new era where cloud computing is going to enable technology on demand, how do you take advantage and rethink the way applications get developed and how that infrastructure, that highly scalable infrastructure, uh, runs and orchestrates those container technologies. So Jeff, and I, Jeff and I work together on both the OCI and the Cloud Native Compute Foundation. As you mentioned, the Cloud Native Compute, Compute Foundation was announced about the same time that the OCI was. I believe that it was June for the OCI at DockerCon and at OzCon in 2015 for the Cloud Native Compute Foundation. Jeff also mentioned that you want to very carefully scope what a standards body tends to work on because boiling the ocean and making your scope too big makes you not move forward very quickly. So the Cloud Native Compute Foundation focused on the broader picture, but not spe specifically the standards. So the Cloud Native Compute Foundation has focused on container packaged, dynamically managed, and microservice oriented architectures for applications. One of the pieces of the Cloud Native Compute Foundation's stack, the application architecture that it has developed, is consuming the OCI standards of tooling like Docker and Rocket or AppC and RunC.
it's not hard to imagine a space where we all want portability. We all want the ability to move our applications and avoid vendor lock-in, which used to look like vertically uh, integrated stacks from a single vendor. Now we're seeing questions of cloud lock-in, meaning public cloud lock-in, or a specific set of services in the public cloud. And just as the OCI wants to make sure you have opportunities around containers to choose the container that best, best fits your application and allows for greatest innovation around container architectures and container systems, the CNCF wants you to be able to have cloud portability. So we tend, we have gone ahead and built an architecture that we use, an end user architecture that we use to think about the different projects that the Cloud Native Compute Foundation has brought into it. So when the Cloud Native Compute Foundation was announced in July of 2015, it was announced as part of the Kubernetes 1.0 announcement as well. The idea was Google and Kubernetes wanted to, or Google wanted to bring Kubernetes to an open source world where there were options and opportunities for people to contribute well outside of Google. And one of the big challenges that we had was people were concerned that Google might abandon the project. So instead of choosing to make a Kubernetes foundation, we chose to talk with the Linux Foundation and bring this broader cloud-native architecture encompassing the application definition and development space, orchestration and management where Kubernetes exists, runtime, which is the actual consumption of the OCI standards, as well as some provisioning tooling around what uh, instrumentation to provision you, your cloud applications exist. Infrastructure and bare metal is outside of scope, but you got to put this somewhere. So the Cloud Native Compute Foundation to date has accepted three projects through our incubation process, Kubernetes being the first, and that was uh, donated by Google to the Cloud Native Compute Foundation in order to bring forward the view that it's an open community. Prometheus is a tool set that allows monitoring of cloud native applications and spends its effort on instrumentation and visibility into those applications. Open tracing is more on the instrumentation side. These are all three projects that are in incubation within the Cloud Native Compute Foundation. And the Cloud Native Compute Foundation is governed because, as Jeff said, governance is an important part of open source. They are governed independently as projects, but with an oversight board of the Technical Oversight Committee. The Cloud Native Compute Foundation took a lot of lessons from OpenStack. We're all here because this is an OpenStack uh, summit. There were many things that we saw that OpenStack did very, very well, and we tried to take and emulate some of those. We also tried to make sure that in being open and in being engaging with our community, we tried to also give some governance around that. But since we're talking about OpenStack, and because Kubernetes is my, well, let's call it my current love of open source, I want to talk about how Kubernetes and OpenStack are working together. There are a lot of ways. There are several projects that we heard from in Dan's portion of the talk. And those specifically are happening, most of them are happening inside the OpenStack community. There is also work that is happening inside the Kubernetes community through the Kubernetes special interest group op OpenStack. So if you search for Kubernetes SIG OpenStack, that's the place that you're going to find most of the people who are interested in integrating the two different infrastructure frameworks. And I'll go through the ones that Dan mentioned quickly as well, because there are two ways, well, three. I'll get to the third in a minute. There are two ways, primarily, that we see OpenStack and Kubernetes working together. The first is making sure that OpenStack is a first-class cloud provider for anyone who wants to run Kubernetes. If the goal of Kubernetes is to give you container packaged applications that are independent of your cloud provider, then OpenStack has to be one of those clouds. 
we have a special interest group for AWS, we have a special interest group for Azure, we have a special interest group for OpenStack. Now, many of the ways that the, that tooling for the first class cloud provider exists outside of Kubernetes is through these different projects inside the OpenStack community, Murano, Courier, Heat, and Magnum. And those all allow for Kubernetes to be deployed on top of OpenStack. What our SIG OpenStack is working on is trying to make these projects be more efficient and make more use of native Kubernetes tooling APIs and not have to work around limitations of Kubernetes through your projects. So it's making sure that we're giving feedback to Kubernetes as the upstream who has to have OpenStack as a first class cloud provider. The second way that we see OpenStack and Kubernetes play together is actually the reverse. So the first was Kubernetes on OpenStack, and then there's a very large group of people who are working at the containerized control plane of OpenStack on top of Kubernetes. And there are a few projects, Cola being the one that is most directly uh, inside the OpenStack community at this point. Stackinetes is something that CoreOS has been working on, and Fuel CCP is the project that Mirantis has been working on. Now, each of, these, each of these different opportunities, or each of these different projects, have given a different opinionated way to run OpenStack on top of Kubernetes, or, or the control plane of OpenStack on Kubernetes, allowing that control plane to manage a separate cluster, independent of your Kubernetes cluster, that has VMs. So this is for the world where we presume containers are more the future, but VMs are something that we will need for a very long time. Kubernetes and OpenStack are going to be something that our enterprises work with for, for many, many years. I don't think there's any reason to see us as, as in competition. The third way that I mentioned is actually another way that uh, that IBM has been working on, which is using a neutron underlay network and then running independently OpenStack and Kubernetes on clusters that share the neutron underlay. So there's a third way. All of this work is happening inside the special interest group OpenStack. So if you have any interest in Kubernetes or containers or OpenStack and Kubernetes more specifically, Come take a peek and see the work that's being done. Please share your ideas, share your pain points, share the ways that you would like to see Kubernetes evolve to either improve the idea of OpenStack as a first class cloud provider within Kubernetes, or to evolve as a way that Kubernetes can run better as an application on OpenStack. As I said, we took a lot of our cues from the governance of OpenStack, which means that our special interest groups actually have a fair amount of independence and power themselves to help make changes. And this is the best possible way for you all to give us feedback, engage with us as either users or consumers of Kubernetes or as someone who might be interested in making any sort of contributions. So we have the closing. Right. Yeah. Do you want to just do the last yeah. slide, and then we'll, then we'll take questions after yeah. the last slide. OK. Uh, so yes, to summarize, um, so te container technology, it's not new. It's been evolving for the last 16, many years beyond that, or before that, if you count CA Trude as well. It's going to continue to evolve uh, with the OCI for the container standards and packaging format, and uh, of course through the CNCF for uh, deploying large clusters and applications based on containers. Um, so containerization is used throughout OpenStack in many different places. You can probably expect it to uh, show up in, in any new projects that enter the big tent or the larger ecosystem. Um, but it looks like Kubernetes is kind of becoming the de facto standard uh, way to do that, to deploy groups of services. And just as the OpenStack Foundation uh, governs the APIs around compute, storage, network APIs, uh, we expect the OCI and CNCF to do the same thing around the container technology itself. 
So uh, again, these things are, are moving fast, lots of companies involved. So if you have a stake or if you have an interest or technical uh, skills, um, please get involved with the OCI, CNCF, and Kubernetes community. So now we've got time for questions because we thought you might all have some. And this is the fun part where you get to ask the challenging slash awkward, awkward slash uh, I, wonder if, I, I wonder if I can get them to cringe if I ask this question question. So, uh, and while- uh -huh. We have one already. Can you step up to the microphone? Oh, there are mics, excellent. There are mics, but maybe I can just speak up. Can you elaborate on the third way? The third way. Um, I can al elaborate very slightly. Um, but what I can do is suggest, suggest that the third way is discussed most in the Kubernetes SIG networking because that's where most of the changes that are necessary to have Kubernetes and OpenStack uh, run on top of a shared neutron network. So I can't elaborate deeply. I haven't tracked it um, that closely. But uh, I know that there is work to have um, the two of them run in parallel on top of the, the Neutron network. So apologies, I can't go much deeper than that, but I can tell you where to find more info. Other questions? So while you're thinking of those other challenging questions, uh, I thought of one myself for Sarah. Don't run away. Well, I'm just going to drink water. <laughs> um, so in some open source communities, there's this concept of a, a BDFL, a benevolent dictator for life. And I was wondering, you know, is there a BDFL for the CNCF? Because, you know, they could come up with some more acronyms. So I, I volunteered for that position. <laughs> Nobody took me up on it. So there is not the concept of a benevolent dictator for life within the Cloud Native Compute Foundation. The Cloud Native Compute Foundation was actually uh, conceived very much more like the US government model with a th three houses of governance. So in the US, we have our Senate and House of Representatives. We have a judicial branch. So we have a legislative branch, a judicial branch, and an executive branch. In the Cloud Native Compute Foundation, the idea is that we have a technical oversight committee who are uh, luminaries from the industry broadly across work that has been done in containers and Cloud Native uh, architectures. We have a governing board, which is more based off of people or companies that have supported the Cloud Native Compute Foundation, which does, handles the business side of this foundation. And then we have a third group which is being formed, which is the end user board. And that is the user voice into this group. So we want to make sure that we are hearing people and companies who are focused on cloud native architectures and want to hear their pain. So the idea is to make this um, a, a balanced governance model. There's not a benevolent dictator for life. Though as I mentioned, each of the projects have their own models of governance. And I can also answer that there's no benevolent dictator for life in Kubernetes. Kubernetes has a uh, has the concept of, or is discussing the concept of an oversight committee or an oversight council called the elders. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just remind folks there's a mic over there, and Sarah, if you want to yeah, hand. Yeah, I can repeat this yep. one too. Sorry, I just have a question. Mm -hmm. Now that you opened that, um, so how about, you have a bunch of nascent uh, technologies coming together. This is important right now, the important when uh, a visionary, somebody mm -hmm. with direction, a visionary. So perhaps it's not a benevolent dictator for life, maybe a benevolent dictator for a year, like, or two. They just, right. What I'm trying to say is to get all the ducks in a row, making sure that all the things are working as a vision. So is there a clear vision being led by an individual or a group for the Cloud Native Compute Foundation or for Kubernetes? Is that your question? Yes. More or less, yes, okay. Um, so for the Cloud Native Compute Foundation, the technical vision is being guided by the Technical Oversight Committee with input from the, uh, the user board as it gets formed and the governing board as, as it stands handling the business side. For Kubernetes, this is part of our transition from being a Google-led project to being a community-led project. 
So for the first year of the project, that was very much held by the technical leads inside Google and had a clear they had a clear vision, they worked on that, and they brought it forward with the 1.0 release in 2015 at OzCon. After we brought it, for, brought it out into public and we wanted to make sure that there was a very much an open and inclusive community in this, we've struggled a bit trying to figure out how to manage that vision, making sure that we don't have too many voices or, or being led too much by um, the broader, the broader community in the sense of people who don't have that clear vision set up. So there is a document that was written early on called What Kubernetes Is Not, which is the standard that we look at. So it's not a platform as a service. It's not, you know, it goes through a list of a few things that it's not. And that gives a couple of things. That gives us a nice open space in the ecosystem for partner organizations to participate. They know these are things that, that Kubernetes is not intending to cannibalize. But it also gives us a reference point. When we came up with the, the Elders Council, the idea was, having pushed much of the, the decision making to um, specific uh, groups that had technological focus, so networking or node. When we pushed those, uh, the decision making closer to those groups that were verticals, we found at some of the interfaces we had technical disagreements. And the elders, the idea is people who have been with the project a while, represent a broad swath of the community, recognize and support and push forward that technical vision. So it's again sort of a supreme court to use the metaphor again, someone, a, a group that can weigh in with an opinion and say this is the way we're going to do it based on that technical vision. Question. Uh, the, thank you. Uh, of the direction of the vision. Uh, just on the plane to Barcelona, I finished reading the Newstack article about the CRIO, uh, yep. where the goal is to abstract away what we currently have on container technologies and base all of that on OCI specifications. Mm -hmm. Because currently we have Kubernetes running on Docker and we have Rocketnetes running on Rocket. Yep. But we don't have the possibility to, to to both at the time or, or, or just say, okay, there's gonna be a third player that implements the specifications um, and we can just plug and play that and, and remove that and take another one. We, maybe the performance of one container engine is better than another one and I just want to play with that. Is, is, is this the vision where, where we want to go with, with all of this? this so, the, so CRIO is a implementation of CRI, which is the Container Runtime Interface. So CRIO, is the OCI implementation of that. So the idea is that CRI is the shim that gets you from Kubernetes to whichever runtime you choose. So CRI O is the OCI version. We see a CRI rocket at some point. We see a CRI, CRI Docker at some point, And that then gives you the API surface to plug in whichever container engine you choose. Yep, great question. I alluded to that a little bit during my portion of it, and I think you're going to see some other interesting wrinkles come up as people look at different facets of trying to address this as we go into next year. The only constant is change. Next question. Uh, so one question more from the practical side. Um, what's the plan of the OpenStack community to make containers a first-class citizen? Because right now, to me, it looks like, you know, when you deploy containers, you're still in Magnum, you still have virtual machines in between. And uh, this is something, for me, like a grown solution, because um, I would expect that containers are some sort of first-class citizens within OpenStack. You want to take that one? I was going to say, I can answer from the Kubernetes side, but go, go for it. this way. No, that's all right. Okay. Go ahead. Um, so in my world, in the future where I get to decide things, um, Kubernetes launches OpenStack control plane, and then you have OpenStack managing its cluster for VMs, and you have Kubernetes running its own cluster for containers. Now, there is certainly a space um, with many of the projects where you are, uh, projects inside OpenStack right now, where they are running, uh, they are actually running 
containers on top of VMs now, which I think is your point. Why would you con run a VM and then run containers on top of that? So the way that I have seen that work so far is to sort of separate them either with the third way, the IBM's um, two independent stacks, or with Kubernetes launching the control plane for OpenStack. I have not seen any work, please correct me if I'm wrong, that yet says here is a cluster for containers that OpenStack can manage by running Kubernetes in its other space. No, but I believe there's integration with, um, with Ironic, so ah. it kind of would cut out a bit of that overhead. Okay. Um, but I don't know what the current state of that one is. Yeah, because Cola still is launching containers on top of VMs, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so the answer is we don't know yet. Actually, actually the demo today showed, I think, that they're now able to do that on bare metal, too. Oh, well, the there you go. The keynote may have shown today that they can launch containers on bare metal. So I, I get to live in a new world. We deploy uh, OpenStack in containers on bare metal. Congratulations. And we, we, no, right? we struggle a lot. And because, I'm sorry. Because um, OpenStack is not that easy to containerize. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of things don't work as expected in a container world. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm asking myself who is bringing the container requirements into the OpenStack applications. Because applications that just hang, because a rabbit in queue is not there, is not that not container right. friendly. Yeah. It's like... I think that there is work being done between the two communities to make sure that the, at least I know, many of the contributors to Kubernetes SIG OpenStack are trying to feed back into the OpenStack projects just exactly those requirements. Now, specifically around containerizing OpenStack, uh, or OpenStack as a control plane, the work that uh, Mirantis and CoreOS have been doing are the two, those are the two groups that I know that are they're spending the most time trying to improve uh, the work or pr improve the projects inside OpenStack that would be containerized to run that. So I don't know that I have a very good answer other than we're working on trying to make communications better in both ways. And we hope to be back here in six months and talk about the progress. Yeah. I was going to say, is there such a thing as special interest groups? Do you need a special interest group Kubernetes to try and, or special interest group containers to try to containerize more of the uh, projects? Or the projects are all pretty siloed in OpenStack governance, right? Yeah. OK. Any more questions? We're just about out of time, uh, but in addition to this project, what else is Google doing in open source? Can you mention a couple of other highlights? Oh, I'd be happy to, um, because as I am working on the Kubernetes community as my primary focus, I'm also helping more of the Google Cloud uh, open source projects, and there are three other ones off the top of my head that I can think of, and I'm helping them work on their community engagement as well. So TensorFlow, which of course is the, um, is the machine learning tool set and neural network tool set that exists coming out of Google, that team is working on and trying to build an engaged community that makes use of machine learning models. There is Apache Beam, which is the Google Cloud data flow version that has been open source. So it's out in the Apache project. They've made a very different choice than Kubernetes did. And then there is also gRPC, which brings us a, an underlying communications mechanism, including things um, relating to uh, protobuf and getting communications between cloud Different, different cloud architectures. gRPC is actually one of the projects that just got pitched to the Cloud Native Compute Foundation as well. So that may end up in, that in there as well. Good answer for a question you didn't even know was coming. I didn't even know it was coming. <laughs> but Google and IBM are both also working in a emerging community around the concept of an open API uh, initiative. And uh, it's based upon the Swagger project. How many have heard of Swagger? So um, taking that project from a single BDFL towards a more open governance model is something that uh, both Google, IBM, and others are collaborating on. And if you want to find out more about other open source projects that IBM is originating, you can check out Developer Works Open. Uh, it's a website where you can find out 
some of the latest projects. An example of one that was on DeveloperWorks Open earlier this year is the IBM Open Blockchain project. And that graduated uh, about mid-year into the Linux Foundation as the Hyperledger project. So lots of interesting things happening in open source. Thanks for joining us for today's session. If you have any other questions, come on up front and see us. We'll be right over here. Thank you. Thanks.